Well, I volunteered for this talk readily because this is the one injury I've actually had. I dislocated my shoulder biking about four years ago. So Charlie just went through diagnosis. And this is really important as far as treatment as well because depending on if you're someone like this who's very flexible or if you're someone like this who has a traumatic injury, the treatment is totally different. So we really spend a lot of time trying to figure out exactly what the underlying problem is. So I'm going to spend most of the talk talking about traumatic instability because that's the most common. And I'm going to especially focus on anterior instability because that's by far the most common. So when we decide what we're going to do about uh, your dislocation, uh, these are the three main factors. So age, as Charlie said, the younger you are, the more likely you are to come out. And we'll go through some statistics later. Your activity level, so what are you expecting to do with your shoulder? If you're a high performance athlete, you know, who needs to get back to a certain sport within a certain amount of time, your treatment may be different than if you were riding your bike and you fell off and you really don't do sports all that much. Also, associated injuries are really important. So if you did tear your rotator cuff or if you have a fracture, which is a broken bone or something like that, we might treat it differently. When you dislocate, the first thing to do is get it back in. So we call this a closed reduction. And these are just pictures of some of the things that Charlie was just describing. So this is the laying on your stomach with a weight and this is really good because you can lay there for a long time and this will gradually overcome the spasms that have occurred. And you may not even need sedation to have this, this succeed. This is a traction counter traction technique right here where we have one person kind of with a sheet that's pulling this direction and another person that's pulling this direction. Um, and in very muscular people, sometimes this requires quite a bit of force. Um, when we talk about local anesthesia, or sedation, local anesthesia is when we put a numbing medicine inside the shoulder, which is sometimes all that's required. Um, sedation is when we actually sort of put you sort of to sleep, not all the way to sleep like a general anesthetic, but uh, make the muscles relax so you're not really aware of what's going on. And that's more pleasant that way. This is my wife, and this is the technique she used on the side of the road on me. She's probably thrilled that her picture's in this talk. Um, so similar to what Charlie showed, this is an x-ray of a dislocated shoulder, so the ball of the humerus is not lined up with the socket. And after reduction, this is the same patient. You can see it's perfectly lined up. So x-rays pretty clearly will show an anterior dislocation. So we almost always treat shoulder dislocations non-operatively. I'm going to talk a lot about surgery as well in this talk, but you should the take home really should be that we try to treat these non-operatively and we're usually pretty successful. Um, we typically will immobilize in a sling for one to three weeks. There is some controversy as to whether we should put the sling in internal rotation, which is kind of with your arm on your chest, or whether we should put it in external rotation, which is out at the side. Um, it doesn't seem to matter too much. Um, the internal rotation brace is a lot more comfortable. We try to get rehabilitation going early. Um, you want to get your range of motion back as quickly as possible so you don't develop a frozen shoulder, uh, which seems hard to imagine if you've just had a dislocation, but certainly can occur. In some cases, we'll actually use braces on the shoulder, especially for athletes who dislocate and still want to get back for the same season that they're currently in, and I'll show pictures of that. So physical therapy, there's a couple of different phases. Uh, this is Amy Burnett. She's one of our shoulder therapists here. Um, in the early phase, we're working on range of motion and we're trying to minimize the, the amount of pain and inflammation. In the late phase, we're working more on strengthening and especially what we call dynamic stabilization, which is using your rotator cuff to stabilize your shoulder while the ligament heals. These are some of the braces we might use for athletes in season or for athletes that have chronic instability. So this is called a Sully or a Sawa brace. Uh, there are two different versions of this similar brace, and these are designed to limit the amount of motion you can put the shoulder through, and they'll tend to limit the amount of abduction and external rotation, which is the position that you typically will dislocate in. Um, this is better tolerated, certainly, by certain athletes than others. Obviously, throwing athletes do not tolerate this at all. Uh, but if you're a linebacker or something like that, you could play pretty well in a brace like that. These neoprene braces are stretchy. Um, you know, they may allow a position player like a thrower to get back to sport earlier, but they don't limit your motion as much and may have a higher recurrence rate. So like I mentioned, age is really important in deciding what we're going to do. So these are the statistics, depending on the study you look at. And most people would agree that the higher numbers are more accurate. 
So if you're less than 20 when you have your first dislocation, you have up to a 94% chance of having another dislocation. And, the, and it drops off, as you can see, as you get older. Anyone know who this is? It's Hippocrates. So Hippocrates was the very first doctor to treat shoulder instability with surgery, if you want to call it surgery. He used a red-hot poker, and he <laughs> stuck it into the front of the shoulder. And what it does is it heats up the tissue and causes all this scarring and contraction of the tissues. And so when the front of the shoulder is tight, you can't come out. So that was the first rec recorded um, treatment. Since then, there's been over 100 different procedures reported um, for treating anterior shoulder instability. There's basic categories, and I'm not going to go into all of these in detail, but they basically involve bony work, such as grafting of the bone from the hip or other places, taking bone from around the shoulder and transferring it, um, repairing the soft tissues only, which is the bank heart, as Dr. Carr talked about, um, and, that, and that includes repairing capsule and ligaments and also rotator cuff, and then some more rare bone realignment procedures for, for patients who have um, bony problems that they may have been born with and uh, cause malalignment. So there's a few reasons that we would operate right away, even though we mostly treat non-operatively initially. If you fracture your glenoid, which is the socket, such as in this picture, this would be an indication for operating soon, because if the fracture heals in this position, you're probably going to keep dislocating. Um, you can imagine that the labrum and the ligaments are attached to this piece. And so if it heals like that, it's not good. So we would generally recommend surgery for an x-ray like this. This is actually a CT scan in three dimensions, which is new technology. Um, also, if you fracture the ball of the humerus, and that doesn't really count the hill sac so much as if you break off the part of the bone that the rotator cuff is attached to. Um, if you tear the rotator cuff, we would operate on that more readily. Um, and also high-performance athletes who need to get back to a certain date and don't want to take the chance that they might dislocate again. So in talking about surgical options, there's a couple different options that are kind of mainstream, and those would be the open and arthroscopic techniques. Um, these are all instruments to use arthroscopically for passing sutures, and we'll go into that in a little more detail soon. And like I talked about, the early versus delayed options. So just reiterating a little bit what Dr. Carr went through, uh, there's two major components that we're trying to fix in the traumatic shoulder dislocation. So first of all, the labrum is detached, and that's this ring that sort of goes around the, this is the bone here, and then this ring that goes around is detached, so there's a gap here. So we want to attach that. And also the capsule stretches a little bit, so we also will tighten the capsule a little bit while we repair it. So those are the two main components. This is another picture of an MRI correlating with the bank heart lesion. So you may remember this exact same picture. This is the labrum, is this little triangle here. And then this is the ligament that supports the shoulder. And so we want to reattach that to where it belongs. And this is on the MRI the same thing. You can see there's this white here is just space filled with fluid. And you can see that that little triangle is missing. And this is it right here. And this black structure is the ligament. So we want to reattach this to this. And so how do we do that? We put these little plastic anchors, very similar to what John Nutting was saying with the rotator cuff. We have little ones that we can put in the glenoid, and we can use the stitches to attach the labrum right back where it belongs. And that's called a bank heart repair. So there's lots of different ways to do this open. An open just means that we make a big incision and we go through muscles. Um, but predominantly now we treat this arthroscopically. But in certain situations, for example, contact athletes, we might opt for this because it may be a little more sturdy, although not significantly so. Um, in certain other conditions, this would be uh, um, potentially preferred. So it generally involves a lot of stitching, a lot of sewing, and a fairly um, big scar relative to arthroscopic techniques. We are able to hide it pretty well, usually in the armpit. So it's not extremely visible, um, but still much more so than an arthroscopic wound. So as far as results for open surgery, they're pretty good. So I mean, greater than 90% success in all these major studies. And by surgical standards, that's really pretty good. And by failure, we mean recurrent dislocation. So arthroscopic repair, which is 
at least in my practice, probably 95% of the, of the cases I do, and probably the same for John and Charlie, um, what we do is we use these little cannulas, which are tiny plastic tubes that go through small incisions that are only about 3 eighths of an inch long. And they allow us to use instruments and a camera to look inside the joint and work. So we usually put one little cannula in the front, so you'll have one little incision right in the front and two in, and, or sorry, two in the front actually here, and this is in the back, two in the, one in the back. And then what we do is we place anchors as needed, and we try to pull the capsule and the labrum back up to where it belongs. So this is a video of a, of a labral repair, and so just to orient, this is the glenoid, okay, and so this is cartilage down here of the socket. This is the ball, and that instrument that you just saw was what's called a suture lasso, and so it's basically kind of a hollow, almost needle-like instrument that's bent, and it allows us to pass a wire through it. This is the wire right here that's in a loop, and so we can pull that out through the cannula, and we've already placed an anchor, which has sutures in it, and it allows us to pull those sutures, i go to the next one, through the tissue, okay? So then we tie a knot, and this is just a picture of kind of cinching that first knot down, holding the labrum in place. And then this is kind of tightening it up, and so you can see here's the labrum, and this is the glenoid, and we're reattaching it, just like in those pictures. And so this is the little instrument we use to tighten the knots down. And this is just looking over the front. This is the front of the shoulder here. So there's our knot, and we can get that nice and tight, uh, just like so. So that's what a bank art repair looks like through the scope. So as far as frequently asked questions for patients who come in that are interested in surgery for this, first is, do I have to stay in the hospital? Um, usually not. This is usually outpatient. How long does the surgery take? Usually takes about two hours. How long will I be in physical therapy? And this one's really variable, and it depends a lot on what other injuries you have. Um, but typically about 10 to 12 weeks, give or take. Um, some folks take a little bit longer to get range of motion back. How long can, until I can get back to my sport? Um, you, it takes a while. I mean, you're talking about six to nine months, because you have to get that labrum. You know, we can put it back where it belongs, but those stitches aren't really all that strong. They hold it there until it actually heals and sticks back to the bone. And that process takes six to nine months. Plus, you have to get your range of motion and your strength and everything back so you can actually perform at the level you were performing before. Um, and then how long until I can get back to work is a more common question. And that's variable as well. Uh, it depends on what you do. If you are a manual laborer or, some, or do something that requires a lot of shoulder motion, it's going to take a while. Uh, but if you have a desk job, you could get back within six weeks. Um, so as far as results of surgery, um, both procedures are very successful as far as surgery goes, with greater than 90% of patients with no residual instability. Uh, it still means, you know, roughly 1 in 10 is going to have another dislocation. So it's not perfect, but it's pretty good as far as surgery goes. Um, arthroscopic surgery may have a very slightly greater risk of recurrent instability, but um, there are a lot of trade-offs and a lot of uh, advantages to arthroscopic surgery, such as not having to cut through muscles like the rotator cuff to get the surgery done. So I'm going to spend just a couple of slides here talking about multidirectional instability, which is sort of the other end of the spectrum. And these are the folks who are extremely loose jointed um, and dislocated in more than one direction, so anterior, posterior, and sometimes inferior as well. Anyone know who this is? Houdini, right. So Houdini was able to get out of uh, straitjackets because he could voluntarily dislocate his shoulders and wiggle out. And that's not actually quite as uncommon. Let's see, there we go. We'll have to watch it in this mode. So this is the party trick shoulder that Dr. Carr had mentioned. And so this isn't quite as uncommon as you might think. And, and these are the patients that are a lot harder to help when they can voluntarily dislocate their shoulder and it doesn't hurt. It's very hard to make it right. All right, so the good news is for multidirectional instability is surgery is almost Non-surgical treatment is almost always successful in more than 80% of patients. Um, we're trying to mainly focus on the, the muscles because these are patients that have very loose ligaments. They usually don't tear their ligaments when they dislocate. They're just loose to begin with. 
And so they rely a lot more on the muscles to control their shoulder than the ligaments. And so if we can make the muscles very strong and make patients understand which muscles to tighten when in a subconscious way, they can really stabilize their shoulder well that way. Surgery is also much less successful if we do do it for this condition. Um, just one more video. This is when we do operate on multidirectional instability, the labrum isn't usually torn. So you can see here the labrum is. This is a normal labrum. But instead of trying to repair the labrum, what we're actually doing is tightening the tissue behind by kind of basically taking a nip and a tuck of the tissue and anchoring it to the labrum and closing down the volume of the shoulder so it has less room for the humeral head to slide in and out of. And this is just another view of this lassoing technique. So we have this wire, and we grab the wire. We've already put a couple in over here. And again, the, the ball is up top, and the socket is down below, and the wire allows us to pull the stitch right through. And this is the cannula, which is the, the plastic tube I was talking about over here, so we can work through that. And we can grab these sutures, and then we tie the knot, and you can see the knot coming down and see how it really tightens things up. And we're bringing capsule from way over here all the way up to here and basically making everything a little more snug. <coughs> so, and then we cut these off with a little scissors. So it's pretty similar technique, but instead of repairing the labrum, we're just tightening on these very loose shoulders. And then just this just shows a, a case where a patient was very loose both front and back, and we have several sutures in the front. Or this is the back, actually, and then a couple in the front here. So just in summary, the diagnosis is really important, traumatic versus atraumatic, because every, everything you do subsequently depends on having the right diagnosis. Um, we almost always try non-surgical treatment first, except in a couple rare conditions. And when we do need it, surgery is fortunately pretty effective, greater than 90%, and it's a pretty predictable and lasting solution. So that's it.